In the 2000s, Apple's iTunes Store revolutionized the music industry by allowing you to use a computer to browse through and listen to free samples of thousands of songs, purchase them for about a dollar each, and in minutes have a digitally mastered copy of your personal playlist loaded onto your portable music player. But that was not as groundbreaking as it might seem because you were able to do all the same things in the 1980s with Personics. Personics was announced in May 1987 and consisted of a record store kiosk where you could browse through a catalog of titles, listen to 15 second samples of the tracks, and fill out an order of up to 90 minutes of your choice of music at prices ranging from 75 cents to $1.50 per song. You'd then take your order to a store clerk and in about 5 minutes you'd be given a custom length cassette tape containing your playlist with laser printed labels and a J-card personalized with the recipient's name and your chosen title for the tape, as well as detailed information on each song. Introducing Personics, your songs with your name and title right on it. Pop down to your local record store and discover Personics. It's got your name written all over it. It was made on a high-speed duplication machine utilizing digital audio sourcing and high bias Sony or TDK tape recorded with Dolby B noise reduction, so the audio quality was actually better than many commercially manufactured albums on cassette. The first Personic system was installed in January 1988 at the Warehouse Record Store in Mountain View, California, and about 40 new locations were opened each month. Initially, only 450 songs were available, but Personics added about 200 songs per month containing both new releases and oldies dating back to the 1950s. I'm the great pretender Just laughing and gay you could also pepper your playlist with sound effects. You get three sound effects for the cost of one song. You could also choose curated playlists called Shortcuts that were featured in their monthly magazine catalogs. And to help entice customers, free bonus tracks were often available. Oh, and there's no censorship on Personics. They just let it roll. F-bombs and all. It was even predicted that Personics would make home taping a thing of the past, because instead of spending an hour or more compiling your own mixtape, you'd rather spend a few bucks to get a higher quality, more attractive looking tape made for you in a matter of minutes. As Personics co-founder Charles Garvin said, instead of looking at home taping as a competitive product to be outlawed, why not instead look at it as a service to be provided? And I think that's the essence of what we're doing. By the summer of 1990, Personics had 250 systems installed at 230 locations in 11 states, although almost all of them were in California and around New York City, Boston, and Philadelphia, with just one system each in Texas, Ohio, and North Carolina. I'm too young to have had any personal experience with Personics, but it was in several Sam Goody music stores here in New Jersey, although strangely not in any Tape World stores. They had a catalog of about 5,000 songs in genres including holiday, rock and pop, heavy metal, stage and screen, rap, dance, world beat, soul, blues, jazz, gospel and inspirational, new age, country, folk and bluegrass, oldies, easy listening, pops, and classical. They had music from 40 different record labels, including MCA, Polygram, Atlantic, Capitol, EMI, and Warner Brothers. 
Those last two should be no surprise because Thorn EMI and Warner Communications were both major investors in Personix. One notable exception was BMG, who refused to license any of their music to Personix. <laughs> So even though Rick Astley was never going to give you up, you had to give him up on Personix because his music was on the BMG-owned RCA label. The system used in the store to produce the customer's tape was based on an NCR industrial PC containing special boards made by Personix controlling two Sony CDK006 60-disc CD changers which were custom modified to operate at two and a half times the normal speed. But the second CD changer was not used to store more music. Instead, it was used to provide redundancy. So the second changer could have the next disc and track queued up and ready to play as soon as the first one finishes. That way, there would not be a long delay between each song on the tape. The CDs were encoded with Dolby Digital AC1 audio compression at a bit rate of 430 kilobits per second, allowing 50 to 70 songs to fit on each disc. That Dolby compression provided a signal-to-noise ratio of about 80 dB and a frequency response of 20 Hz to 18.5 kHz. Not quite as good as uncompressed CD quality audio, but still more than sufficient to make excellent sounding tape recordings. You may ask, why didn't they use hard drives to store the music instead of CDs? Well, even with that Dolby compression, their library of 4,000 to 5,000 songs took up about 90 gigabytes of storage space. And back in 1988, hard drives were nowhere near big enough in capacity to store that. For example, here's a hard drive from 1988. It's a 5 and a quarter inch full height drive. It cost about $700 when it was new, and it has a capacity of 80 megabytes. Only enough to store about three to four songs at the bit rate Personix was using. But the digital audio mastering computer at Personix main office had about one gigabyte of hard drive storage, which was an enormous capacity for the time. The cassettes were duplicated using a Nakamichi tape transport running at eight times the normal speed. The system could also optionally automatically rearrange the tracks to make the two sides of the tape as equal in length as possible to avoid that annoying few minutes of blank tape that you often got at the end of pre-recorded albums on cassette. Something that only the finest home CD players of the era, with features specifically designed for copying CDs to cassettes, could do. Personix initially considered using Bass Chrome tape because that's what several of the major labels were using at the time for their releases on Chrome tape, but they ultimately decided to go with TDK SA tape because they felt they had better brand recognition with the general public who would consider Personix as an alternative to making their own recordings at home. And then in 1990, they switched to Sony UX high bias tape. Probably as part of a promotional deal, because in the back of their magazines, they had several pages of ads for Sony tapes, including Metal SR audio tape and Sony V video tape. At the Personix headquarters in Redwood City, California, a Sequent Systems S81 multiprocessor 386 server running Unix called out to every Personix system overnight by modem to download each day's sales data. This daily inventory also helped to prevent clerks from running off extra tapes because each tape had a unique number and was logged with the ID of the employee who made it. And if you look closely at that number that's printed on the tape, which will probably require magnification because it's so tiny, it begins with the date the tape was made. In this case, September 28th, 1989. Personix was on the cutting edge of technology at the time, and initially the company was profitable and seemed to have a bright future, but unfortunately it didn't last. They filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection on December 31st, 1990 and closed all of their in-store systems. So what happened? 
Well, as co-founder Charles Garvin explained in several interviews, Personics was an extremely ambitious attempt to rethink retail music delivery. The consumers and retailers reacted very positively to the idea. Our failures were at the label level. The major labels proved completely unwilling to allow their material to be distributed in anything other than the traditional means, despite a great deal of attention to security and copyright issues. Let somebody come along with a duplicating machine with some super duper uh, recording machine and super duper cassette and you'd be able to push a couple of buttons uh, and and inside of 20 minutes there'd be a brand new Mercedes 87 or 88 Mercedes in your driveway or a Cadillac. You want to see some people get up in arms quick about copyright infringements and about somebody not getting paid for their product? We underestimated the music industry's extreme conservatism and ran into their great fear that someone will come along and cannibalize their hits, despite loads of evidence that the system actually increased net music sales. You don't own me. There was no label that ever got down to releasing music to us within a few months of release. We tended to get older catalog material, and we tried to make good use of that. But in the end, the record business is a hits business. If you don't have the hits, then you can't really sustain an operation. And you can see that lack of current hits reflected in some of the song choices on these Personics tapes. For example, this one has the Gary Morris version of The Wind Beneath My Wings. When I think it's more likely they wanted the Bette Midler version, but Personics did not have it, so they settled for this version instead. Did you ever know that you're my hero? Bob Zyder, one of the investors who helped launch Personics, put it bluntly, the recording labels finessed it by releasing dog shit to us. So if you were looking for Beatles songs in the Personics catalog, you wouldn't find any. They'd only give you Ringo. This is a bigger waste of time than Ringo's songwriting. With 45 RPM singles rapidly flaming out in the late 1980s, and cause singles not really being the one and only successor to them, and CD singles not really smelling like success either, at least in the US, people thought Personics would become the new dominant way to buy singles. But it turns out the record companies didn't really care to sell you singles. They would much rather force you to pay $15 for a 15-track CD than $1 for the one good song on it that you really wanted. You enjoy it. You want to enjoy it. You want to listen to it. You ought to pay for it. Sometimes they almost even rubbed it in your faces by putting a big sticker on the album saying it includes the massive single. Yeah, includes, because that's the only way you can buy it. Personics bankruptcy led to the demise of those in-store kiosks, but it didn't lead to the demise of the entire company. Time Warner and Thorn EMI bought them out and continued it as a direct marketing service. In 1992, you could order by mail, fax, or telephone 10 songs on a cassette for $9.95 plus shipping or 20 songs for $17.95 plus shipping. They also started a subscription service called Club 10, luring you with the offer of three free tapes every month and rebate coupons for full albums on cassette and CD worth $20 every month. Personics even launched an online music store on CompuServe in late 1992 called The Song Shop, which was probably the first online service where you could purchase a customized playlist of music, just like the iTunes store over a decade later, except with the delivery method being a cassette tape that arrived in the mail, rather than digital audio files that would have taken hours to download and used up most of your hard drive space. Personics also produced cassettes for promotional use, such as the cassettes that you could order from a box of honeycomb cereal with your selection of songs and chosen title on it. But with cassette tapes falling out of favor by the mid-90s and CDs taking over, Personics quietly disappeared by the end of 1994.
and in 1995, a large quantity of those custom-modified Sony CD changers that Personics used ended up on the surplus market, and electronics hobbyists discovered a way to remove that modification and restore them to normal CD playback. And in December 1995, the Personics trademark was cancelled. Personics was by no means the last attempt at selling music a la carte until the iTunes store came along, but every other attempt to do so ended up being kneecapped in the same way. The record labels refused to license them the current popular music that people actually wanted. These days, with cassette tapes having at least a moderate resurgence in popularity, I do wonder if there are any Personics systems out there that are still fully intact and could be put back into service. That's probably unlikely, but in the meantime, at least we can enjoy the Personics tapes that were made, because as you've heard, they still sound great after all these years, and each one provides a unique insight into somebody's personal playlist of music and sometimes sound effects from decades ago. For example, I have no clue who Lena Dixon is, but I hope she had a fun girls' night out back in 1989.